Firstly, it's nice to be in this really interesting place. First, I've been to Heathrow, passed through Heathrow so many times and uh, didn't know this little town existed. Um, but on my way, I discovered that there's a, about the fifth uh, terminal or something. Is there something? Yes. Uh, Allah help you guys, inshallah. <laughs> um, so nice to be in, you know, this Friday night. Friday night uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this a useful time. Uh, I mean, uh, a beneficial time for all of us, inshallah. Uh, what I want to speak about, I, I mean, expertise is very difficult to say about marriage issues, related issues because every situation is unique. Every situation is unique in a marriage. There's just so many variables, so many issues, so many. Uh, unique little contextual uh, situations that it's very difficult but what I want to cover today are just a few points just to get the just to get the discussion going and then actually what I would like to do is to invite you to uh, uh, to ask questions or to discuss something because I think when it comes to marriage it's better that I that, that we speak about something that is directly relevant to somebody than me coming and giving a spiel on something that I think is necessary. Uh, the way this came up is, uh, mashallah, one of your sisters here, um, Sister Sara Malik, uh, she met at a program. So she's written a book on, I'm, allowed, I'm assuming I'm allowed to promote the book, right? Um, I, I forgot the name of the book, but it's a book on marriage, uh, especially for women. I haven't read it all, I've just read the little intro in the beginning and intend to read the rest of it. So. Um, I saw a husband as well. Uh, yeah. There you go. I hope you read the book and you agree with everything in it. Uh, you've lived it. Okay. So, alhamdulillah. Uh, so the thing is that a lot of people are saying you need to uh, to me that write a book on bringing up children. And the only reason I actually felt somewhat um, comfortable in writing about a book about marriage is called the Handbook of a Healthy Muslim Marriage. That's my one, and uh, the only reason is because I've been married for over 23 years, I think, and uh, uh, dealing with people's issues for over 20 years as well. So then felt like, okay, I think now I could write something about it. Otherwise you feel like a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. Now when they say you need to write about something about bringing up children, that is a, probably even a more daunting task, I think. Uh, and the reason is that I'm waiting for my two elders to actually get them married off and then they stay married for at least two years successfully and then I'll feel okay now maybe I can write because that is our responsibility is to get them to that level that's how important it is but anyway let me just get an idea how many of you are not married here I'll ask that question because I think most of you are married so how many of you are not married just so I know how to orient my talk I up. Unless you don't want to get married, then... Right? Um, okay, that's about... Probably about... Not even 10%, I think it's about 5 to 10%. Okay, that's fine. Um, so what I'm going to speak about, it's... The, the things I'm going to speak about is... I'm going to call them preparation for marriage. But it's actually way beyond just preparation for marriage. Right, in a short time, just going to... Just thinking points. So what I mean by preparation for marriage is let us first think what do we mean what do most people do when they prepare for marriage so if you think back most of you are married if you think back to the first time marriage came as a concept in your mind and found a place eventually found and fl was floating around eventually found a place in your mind it was probably when you were about 16 17 18 around that period right 19 20 maybe and it's getting later now before it was about 17, 18, you get married by about 20 something. But now, maybe at, it'll start at 20, 25, and then maybe you'll get married at 27. It's getting later. But you know when you first get that idea of marriage, somebody floats, it's generally an auntie or an, or an uncle. Right? They're like, yeah, we need you to get married. Shadi karani. Right? Something like that. And then you suddenly start feeling the butterflies in your stomach. Do you still remember that feeling, anybody? Right? You start feeling like, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I can get married. I've been thinking about it for a lot, while now, mashallah, they're taking... So now you start, generally what happens is people start idealizing their spouse, a spouse. 
the perfect spouse. This is what I'm looking for. They look around, they identify something like, yeah, that's the kind of thing I want. That's preparation. It's a more of a psychological preparation. Um, additionally to that, generally men will also have to think about monetary issues. Am I going to be able to support a wife, get a job and so on, and have a place to stay? From a woman's perspective, it's generally going to be, am I going to be living with the in-laws or not? That's a big issue at this kind of stage. Then the next stage of preparation for marriage is when you actually find someone. You get serious about it, you find someone, however you find someone. right? You finally located somebody, now it's all about the day. So the next major level of preparation is all about the day. So you identify, you fix the day, then you have to find the... There is now so much effort that is put on those few days, and maybe a honeymoon afterwards if it's to follow. All preparations, all effort, all focus is on that. The cuisine, the, the guest list, if I call so-and-so, I must call his brother and sister, otherwise somebody's going to feel upset, etc., etc. The dress, the, the, the suits for those one or two days, huge, huge amount of focus. In fact, if you're going to get married after six, seven months, a year maybe, I mean, what, six, seven months, nine months, every week becomes a wedding week afterwards. A shopping week. Where do you guys go to do your shopping, by the way, for wedding? South. South. Okay, that's not bad. I asked in Glasgow, they go, we go to Lahore. Right? And some people go to Dubai, and um, then there's Leicester, and then there's, uh, there, there used to be East London Green Street before, but yeah, South Home is decent, actually. The Broadway. So, now it's all about those days. It's all about those days. But there, there's no real preparation for marriage that takes place. That's the problem. What I'm trying to say is that the real preparation as to what's supposed to happen thereafter, hardly anybody prepares for. So they're all preparing for those two days to such a degree that those two days, uh, that day, the day of marriage, maybe the Walima day, you know, depending on how many days you're going to do things, it becomes such an important day, and it is an important day, we're not trying to downplay it, but it becomes such an important day that I've even heard people say they, they want to do some weird haram stuff in there sometimes. Let them do it, it's their only day. That's how important this day is. I mean, th that's not my topic, but that's actually the day you need to be most fearful of Allah. Because that's the day when you're going to start a whole new chapter of marriage where you need every bit of barakah you can from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that's a separate topic anyway. So then people prepare for that day, and then they may prepare for a honeymoon. But the real grind, the real grind of this is going to start afterwards. The Prophet وسلم, said that, and he was speaking to men, and he said that women are married for four reasons, primarily. There are many reasons to marry, always, right? But primarily four reasons. So he's talking to men, that's why he said, mentioned women. If he's talking to women, he would probably mention similar things about men. Uh, the wealth, the family lineage, wealth, family lineage, the beauty, and the deen. So these four things, Never, nowhere does it discourage the four, any of the four. But what the encouragement is, the priority should be for righteousness. If you get everything else as well, or at least some of them, or most of them, alhamdulillah, nothing wrong with it. In fact, there's positives in all of these things. It's only when you become obsessed with one thing, and you forget the religious aspect, that's when it's probably, because all of these other things are short-lived. So you got somebody from a very good family, uh, from a specific family. I mean, what are you going to boast about? How long are you going to boast for about that? Generally, it's for boasting things. But there's a benefit to it. The benefit is that we believe in genetics. So if you do get married to a spouse from a certain family, because certain families, they're known for certain qualities. Some families are known for generosity. Some families are known for a very religious nature. Some families are just known to be very decent people. So, for example, one of the things that was a criteria for my father was that we don't want to get married to any family that are kind of wild. Which means that something small happens and they'll come with baseball bats to resolve it. Right? I mean, fair game, right? That's fair, fair. Uh, that, that, that wasn't too much to ask for. So, even if you look at the Arab tribes, there were tribes known for things. And I remember before I became an imam in one of the masjids in London, one of the scholars who passed away now, he sat me down and he told me all about his assessment of the major families in the area. 
okay, these guys are like this, this is like this, you can trust these guys, these guys like this, they generally, and because that's something which is a very social understanding that you get to know about these things. So there's nothing wrong with marrying somebody for a good family because don't you want those good genes to pass on to your children? Right? Yourself, you'll have inshallah some positives in your family that can pass on. You hopefully want some positives from and get mashallah these nice hybrid super children inshallah. Right? Number two, it was the wealth aspects. And again, if that's what you're obsessing over, the wealth could be lost tomorrow, you'll be left nothing. So that's why it's not something you can exclusively focus on. But again, there's no problem if you get a spouse with good money. You know, if you've got a rich father-in-law, he, he might help you buy a house. You know, he may get, help you get a house, get a loan. And at the end of the day, your children are going to, inshallah, inherit. There's nothing wrong with wanting your children to inherit from their mother. For example, you're talking to the men. Then when it comes to the whole beauty aspect, now this is where a lot of people get really because there's a lot of dopamine in this. Now, they've done this research on marriage and dopamine. Because dopamine is that, the drug, the, 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 the hormone that is released when you get excited about something, <coughs> along with, you know, with, with the adrenaline. When you're not focused on the real things, generally what happens is that you get a dopamine rush every time you see somebody. Because it's kind of a taboo situation. You get a dopamine rush. But you haven't focused on the main issues. So then when you actually get married to this person, they don't have anything more substance to provide except just that initial dopamine. Then there's no more dopamine anymore. So what then happens is you're left with nothing and then that marriage just goes, on to, the, uh, goes to the rocks. That's why a marriage has to be much more substantial. Another thing you have to think about, let me say it in a very crude way. If you get the most stunning spouse, like from, from a man's perspective, you find the most beautiful, attractive wife, right? Stunning, head turner, right? Is marriage then going to be that you're going to put her on a pedestal and just watch her all day? Like, is that what marriage is about? <laughs> marriage is a lot more than that. So it's wonderful if you've got somebody you're attracted to. In fact, that's, I think, strongly encouraged, especially in the hypersexualized world we live in today, right? No doubt. But remember, that should not be the, pr the only focus and the primary focus. Now, quickly, when the Prophet said that you should be a winner, you should be a champion with the religious one. What do we mean by religion here? Again, there's misunderstanding in this regard. Religion in this regard is the religious aspects related to marriage. What is the ingredient of religion that is most relevant to marriage? So if you look at what the Prophet ﷺ said, he said, I am the best of you in character and I am the best of you to my wives. So it's the character aspect which is most important. So the person's praying, she's praying, she's covering, etc. That's important. But we also have to look at the akhlaq because that's the most relevant aspect of the deen here. Right? In the marriage context because it's all about interaction. It's all about character. It's all about conduct. It's all about interaction. That's huge. Right, now let's get back to preparation of marriage. So... The guys who are married, they're going to be wondering, like, what's this got to do with us? Preparation of marriage. Well, several things. Number one, when I say preparation of marriage, while I'm focusing on those who are not married, really, it's about everybody. Because if you got married without preparing this way, then you still got time to prepare to enhance your marriage now. Right? If there's a problem in it. So it's just a way of thinking about these things. Preferably, it should be done. Now, where do I get this from? When I wrote the book, I like to send the book to pre-publication readers, critical ones, before you publish it. You actually, you know, send it to print. You'd rather have people critique the book before it gets published and printed, because then at least you can make some changes if there's some valid critique. And there's always going to be something that you missed. So I sent it to many. Majority of the, those I sent it to were women, because I wanted the book to be balanced. I've never been a woman, never will be a woman, inshallah. Um, so it's difficult for me to, it's difficult for men to understand women, right? Because seriously, there are major differences. And when men don't get that, they make big mistakes. Likewise, when women don't understand men, they make big mistakes because they're just projecting their own ideas and emotions onto the other spouse, which generally happens. <coughs> so one of the benefits of the, that the first 60% of the book was actually, actually written up, drafted from my lectures and other written work that I've done by a woman. 
So she produced the first 60% of it based on my lectures and other things. Then I carried on and uh, made it, you know, edited it and, and, and that's what I did. But then I sent it to... Now, one of the guys who I sent it to, he's a, he was a PhD student at the time. I think he's finished now. He said, you haven't spoken about um, pre-marriage counseling. It's like people are struggling with post-marriage or within marriage counseling, there's not enough counsellors out there. There are lots of counsellors, but there aren't enough counsellors that understand the Muslim paradigm. And if you're from an Asian paradigm, an Arab paradigm, that's very relevant. You can never divorce culture from a marriage situation. We are culture. A lot of people that come and say, you know, I want a marriage without any culture. So let me ask you a question. How would you spend Eid day with no culture? What would be the Islamic way of spending Eid? There's a few things you do, but once the Eid prayer is finished, you've made your dua, you've come back home. There's nothing else in Islam that you do on day of Eid. What are you going to do? You're going to sleep all day, right? That's when you go and visit graveyards and all of these other things, right? Which are cultural, but there's nothing wrong with those culture. Yes, we do have problematic aspects of culture which need to be weeded out. Massively problematic cultures, right? Cultural aspects, like forced marriages to your cousin. That is something which is a massive no-no. I've seen people leave the deen because of that. Right? And that seriously needs to stop. And that's something we need to vocalize much more. And, and, and stuff like that. And other abuse things. That's not the point. So, he's talking about premarital. You know, even before you get married, you go for counseling. So, initially I was a bit taken aback. But it makes a lot of sense. Now, what I'm going to say to you is not in the book. In this way. Because this is something that... You know, once you write a book, then you relax for a while, and then these other ideas come in, right? That's just a never-ending game of this in, this, in this regard. So, what this means is, and again, this is just to generate thought, and discussion, reflection. What do we mean by premarital counseling? Or premarital, yes, premarital counseling, or premarital preparation, preparing for marriage. Simple things. If... The, we just have to be honest with ourselves. We need to think about how our interaction, how am I going to live with this person as two human beings? Now tell me something, most of you are married. How many of you have marriages in which you have never had any minor, major or minor problem? How many, is there anybody here who's never had a major or mi even a minor problem in their marriage? No. <laughs> so, you know, the thing is that I think that doesn't exist. I'm still looking, but even if I look at the Sunnah, there was an there were occasion, there was definitely one occasion when the Prophet went away from all of his wives into a loft for about nearly a month. 29 or so days. To the degree that Umar radiallahu whose daughter was married to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Hafsa anha, he got worried. He says, has the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa divorced his wives? And then he went and had a discussion with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was on some expense issues and stuff. Yet on another occasion, one of the best couples in the world, which is Fatima radiallahu anha, Ali radiallahu anha, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes to look for Ali radiallahu anha, wants to meet him for something, goes to the house. Fatima radiallahu anha comes out. Where's Ali? Oh, he's, we've had a bit of an issue, he's in the masjid. So that's where they would retire to relax or think or reflect when they would not be, not to the shisha lounge or whatever else that people go nowadays. So the Prophet went to the masjid and Ali was calmly sleeping there on the ground, on the, on the sand. So then he, has, he, he formulates this affectionate name for him, Qum Aba Turab. It's in Arabic, it's like father of dust. It's just... Because it's, he had it all on his body, so that, that's just his affection. So, uh, issues in marriage are inevitable. Any two people come together for whatever reason, there's going to be issues. So, preparation means to deal with issues. How do I deal with issues? How do you know what kind of issues are going to come up? You don't. But we do know our weaknesses if we're honest about it. And that's what I mean by preparation now. So, those who are not married, think about this. Those of us who are married, let's also think about this because this is what may be messing up our marriage. What? So let's start with a simple one, an easily diagnosable one, which is anger. Am I an angry person? 
Am I somebody who gets angry very quickly? You gotta know this. From the way we deal with our siblings, our parents, our children, if I'm talking to the married people, our co-workers, our colleagues, our neighbors or whatever. Anybody who really gets us irritated, how do we respond? Compare, I, I generally compare myself to my brothers, for example, or my classmates, or other ulama, you know, whatever. You can, there's always points of reference. Do I get more angry? So, from an Islamic personality perspective, from an anger, for, uh, regarding anger, there are four personalities that the ulama have spoken about. It's just a way for us to understand where we are with this. Number one, he gets somebody who gets angry very quickly, very frequently, and calms down very quickly. That's just the nature. So red in the face, one moment, and then suddenly smiling. Red in the face, smiling. Well, that's an exaggeration, but you know what I mean. Number two, the second personality is one who hardly ever gets angry. Maybe once a year, maybe every two years or something. Hardly ever. And when they do get angry, they stay angry for a very long time. Number three is kind of hybrids of the two. Now you must be thinking, which one am I, you know, everybody must be thinking, which one am I? Like an honest assessment. Not about who, what he is or the other person is. I know what that one is, you know. Let's talk about ourselves. The third one gets angry very frequently, very quickly, and calms down very slowly. Now this guy is generally going to be red in the face, probably. S permanent scowl, maybe even lines. And before the person even calms down from the first one, something else gets him angry. And before he calms down from that, there's a third thing which gets him angry. It's always angry. Right? It's always rage. That's the third one. The fourth one is somebody who hardly ever gets angry. And when they do, they calm down very fast as well. So once in a blue moon they get angry, but then they calm down very fast as well. So now tell me which is the best one? The last one. The last one. You really think so? Sometimes you get those people, they just like so relaxed, so laid back that even if something serious is going on, they don't, they don't have any oomph. They have no fire in them. Their, deen is, their family may be abused, their deen is being abused, they're walked over and it's like, yeah man, it's all alright. You know? So... There's probably a little hybrid issue there that you have to look at. But which is the worst one? I think we can agree on that one. Which one is the worst one? The third one. The third one, I think pretty much everybody will agree, is always angry. That's definitely not nice. Now, we're going to know where we are. I mean, these are four major personality types, and there's going to be shades in between, right? There are shades in between everything, it seems, right? So, now what we need to figure out is where we are and actually the main thing is this is just an ingredient of characters described by our ulama all the way from Ghazali rahimahullah, to the more recent ones they say that our character is based on three or four main ingredients and one of them is anger that is going to uh, that is going to affect so many different things too much of it or too less of it right it's not the time for that but the point is let's think about it the way to correct our anger, what benefits in me, for example, because I know I get a bit more angry than my brother does. So I consider that I've got that issue. So it's to read Quranic verses. Allah speaks about the benefits of uh, calming down anger. Those who control the anger. There are numerous hadith about it, where the Prophet actually even gave practical suggestions. Sit down, he said. Once. Ibn uh, Abu Dhar radiallahu anh, he's in the middle of a field, water. Somebody got him angry, he sat, he sat down. Got him angry, carried on. He lay down in the mud, in the, in the, in the muck there. He said, why are you doing this? Water There's a psychological reason behind this as well. When you're standing up, you're much more confrontational. Right? That's why they say, if you want to criticize somebody, not Muslims, I'm saying just general side, if you want to criticize somebody, then don't ever do it standing. Like you see somebody else and brother, I want to speak to you outside you take them around, you start telling them something, it's a bad, bad idea. They're just too confrontational. Psych so the best way to do it is not even sit down but make them lie down. I don't know how you're going to do that. Right? Maybe invite them for some food and give them some nice cushions and like, brother, relax. Okay. Then start. Right? Um, but it works. Believe me, I've tried it. When I've stood up and done it, I've just not had the right reaction. 
when you've sat down and done it, it just has a better reaction. You're just less confrontational. Also in America, for example, if you get stopped by the police in a car, you're not supposed to get out. I mean, when I was there once, I did get out. I was like, get back in, get back in, we could shoot you. The other thing is that what they do is, you're supposed to sit there with your hands there and roll down your window. The policeman will never come in front of you. He'll never come in front and confront you that way. He'll stand behind you and speak to you like, why are they speaking from here? It's just because when you have confrontation, things can go wrong. That's why in a hadith, the Prophet said, if you've got a knife, don't wave it around. Maybe shaitan will pull your hands. And have you ever held a knife like that, and, or a gun for that matter? There's this weird shaitani feeling that God knows what happens. It's just this weird, like, let me do something with it. So there's adab for these things because there's a psychology behind it as well. So we should know. Now, if your anger is serious, like for example, there's a scholar of the subcontinent, uh, Hakim al Ashabali Tami, he once did a long lecture on anger. It's a huge lecture. Then he explained why. He said, I felt that I've got a lot of anger in me or I've got some anger in me. So I decided to research it so I could... I've benefited hugely from such works when they did like Ghazali Zihya, Rahimullah and so on. When they talk about anger, it makes a big difference to you. And seriously, if you think you've got a bigger problem, we need to be honest with this. Go, there are anger management courses. Right? Anger management courses online. You know, you could do them anonymously. But we, just like they say with mental health, we need to recognize that we've got a problem so we can sort it out. If you've been married for 15 years and you know this is an issue, it can, we can still sort it out. So when I say preparation for marriage, it's also preparation for a better marriage. Not just for people who are not yet married. Okay, that's one. Number two. Are we um, very emotional, sensitive, weepy, we cry over small things, get really sensitive, give the silent treatment? Is that our personality? No, no, some of these things will be more in women, some will be more in men, and that's fine, right? That's how Allah created us. Now, one thing we have to realize is that Allah created every one of us with certain strengths and certain weaknesses in terms of emotion and behavior. For example, look at miserliness, stinginess and generosity. Compare yourself to your brothers and sisters. Are you more generous than them or are you... Are we less generous than, for example, my brother? So, for example, I've recognized that my brother, at least two of them, I think they're more generous than I am. I've recognized that. I'm not sinful for that because that's just my nature. I get more angry. Now, somebody may be slightly more stingier, tighter, restricted, however you want to call it, but they may be more intelligent. The brother or sister is less intelligent, right? Someone will be more, in, uh, what's the word? Uh, uh, more emp uh, someone will have more empathy, someone will have less. Someone will be more selfish, someone will have less. You'll have always a range of good and bad. We're not sinful for that. That's nature. That's fitra. It's when we exercise that in the wrong way. So for let's take the issue, issue of, of miserliness. If I exercise that way I'm supposed to spend, then I'll be either sinful or blameworthy. So where do you think we're supposed to spend where we'd be sinful if we didn't? Zakat, for example. Right? We're not giving up where you're too stingy, we just can't do it. The other one is, okay, that's fault, right? That'd be a big sin. There's a huge fundraiser about the Rohingya or Syrians or whatever, and like everybody's crying, they all take out money, but I can't even give 10 pounds. I've got it. It's not like I don't have it. Now, you can seriously tell I've got a problem here. Right? So it's about recognizing that. Number three, you go to eat somewhere with your friends. Where'd you guys go to eat? Nawabs? Or where'd you guys go to eat? Nawabs? Is that your like local? Right? We go every month actually. <laughs> okay, wherever you go, right? Uh, I saw one like on the corner here. It's called, what was it called? Achari. Ach Achari. Is that like a, that's not one of yours, right? Okay. Taste of Pakistan. Shalom, uh, taste of India, Pakistan, whatever you want to call it. Um, so you go there, and when it comes time to pay the bill, you go toilet to wash your hands. <laughs> And you keep kind of doing this. Now, you can tell that they, I've got, there's a problem here. So as I said, you're not punishable for the nature upon which Allah created you unless you use it in the wrong place, 
or you withhold it in the wrong place, whatever that is. That's the beauty of correcting character. So if you are an emotional person, right, and constantly you're giving people the cold treatment, the silent treatment, and so on. One woman I know, I know both sides, she got married to a family in which the father had passed away, the father-in-law, she, she wouldn't have a father-in-law, it'd be a mother-in-law, two disabled sister-in-laws and one disabled brother-in-law and she was going to be staying with the family and she was fine with that. Khidmah, I have no problem with that. She gets married but the mother-in-law's got a problem and she gives the silent treatment anytime something goes wrong. Can't deal with it. Just gives the silent, two, day, two days you're not know, speaking. How can you live like that? Alhamdulillah, the husband was a very decent person, very wise. He, he got another house close by, the one in the northern area, so it's cheaper to do that there, right? And mashallah, now it's all fine. But what I'm trying to say is that if you do have that problem, you can get help. What is the help for that? SubhanAllah, you know that if you cry easily and you get emotional easily, you have a gift of Allah. You're just channeling in the wrong place. There are people out there who would give anything to cry a few tears in front of Allah. On the 27th night, they're making dua to Allah, come on, let me cry, because that's one of the recommendations. They can't cry. Masha'Allah, you cry for free. Right? Use the crying. So what Jerry, our ulama mentioned about this? Two things. When you feel weepy about whatever it is, open the Quran. Get a translation, a tafsir. And read, and you'll find so many places to weep for the right reason, and it'll be a huge spiritual boost for you when you do that. That will remove all your agonies. You'll see bigger issues that you'll deal with through the Qur'an, number one. Number two, if you can't have the Qur'an in front of you, whatever, put your hands out, cry to Allah. Don't waste your tears, basically. That emotion that you got, send it to Allah, and you'll get a much better response. Allah will sort things out for you, rather than just be sad and try to deal with it. And about two months ago, I was up somewhere else, uh, I think it was in Scotland, and somebody said, when, he, when they were hearing all of this, like, how do we prepare our children for marriage? Said, wow, that's a big question. But seriously, it's just like this. Once my child, uh, when kind of six, seven, eight, and they came back from school, he said, I'm not speaking to some friend of his. He just mentioned that as a comment, as a remark. It's like, where'd you get that from? Where'd you learn to stop talking to people? That's so lazy, right? That is just such a lazy approach to just, every time something happens, you stop talking to somebody and you deal with it. So if it's bothering you, then what we have to understand is if somebody's bothering you and we say bad things about them and all the rest of it, and you have to be in class with them for the next three, four years, you have to be at work with them for the next three, four, five foreseeable future, and you're just aggravating worse, you just give them back as much as they give you, it's just going to get worse. Rather than that, why don't you give them some dua? Make a dua to Allah to sort them out. Because if they get sorted out, everybody's happy. You've got a better environment. So I said to my children, you are not going to break up with anybody. That's a lazy, I just made it sound so bad to them. I've never had that complaint again. They don't break up with people, inshallah. Of course, there are valid reasons for where you stop. There are valid reasons, valid circumstances for that. But that's not like a, a way that you deal with you know, little issues that you just stop talking to them. That's lazy. Right? Right, so that was two things. Are you understanding everything so far? <laughs> How old are you? Eight. Are you understanding everything so far? Just about. Do you break up? Do you break up with people? Sometimes you shouldn't. Okay, so these two were easy. They're easily diagnosable. You just have to be honest with ourselves, and I'm sure we can figure this one out. I've already told you about myself, right? So, number three is more difficult. This one is highly difficult. Right? So see if you can understand this one. Are you a narcissistic, domineering, always right individual? Arrogant, narcissistic? You basically, do you always think you're right? And everything must be according to the way you want it. If you are like that, you're going to be in big trouble in a marriage. You're probably already in big trouble in a marriage. Maybe you've just learned to dominate in a way that everybody's silent. They don't say anything because, believe me, we get questions, issues from people. Uh, they said, this is what it is. I said, 
can you not get, he won't listen. I said, can you get his father? He doesn't listen to his father. Can you get so and so? He doesn't listen to anybody. I go, what about the local sheikh in the masjid? No. He doesn't listen to anybody. He doesn't listen to anybody. Now, I know I'm using men, men examples, but it can just be, you know, women as well. So it's not one sided or the other. Are you that kind of individual where you are right? Believe me, people around you are having hell. They may not say anything. Just because somebody doesn't say anything in a marriage, it doesn't mean it's a happy marriage. There should actually be such a free discussion in a marriage. If you look at the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, and you look at the wives' interactions and what they used to do and say, if anybody else from the Sahaba did that, they would have probably become kafir in some cases. But what you can get away with as a spouse is a special, it's a special thing. And that healthy to and fro, as you actually see with the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, is natural. It's, it should be there. There are, there are especially um, since there aren't too many kids here, right? I'll still try to keep it. Especially when it comes to intimacy issues, that's a massive problem. There are so many people who come and say, um, they'll tell you that these are our issues in marriage, these little s surface issues that, like, how can you break up over that? Like, are you serious? But those are just symptoms. The deeper issue is fulfillment issues, major issues. And they can't say anything. Uh, just, uh, I gave a talk in one of the northern towns recently, and then a woman emailed me, she's like, I just don't get satisfaction. But I can't say anything. I then have to do it privately afterwards and I feel so guilty but I can't say that to my husband what I want him to do because what I want him to do he thinks is haram but it's actually she, it's not haram he heard somewhere or whatever or it's wrong or whatever but then it, there has to be that and the husband has to create that environment where that discussion can take place there should be nothing taboo in a marriage to discuss and let me say it for the women as well even the second husband is sorry Second wife issue. <laughs> that is an issue. <laughs> that would be an issue, yes. Um, well, alhamdulillah, you should get the joke. So, um, the second wife issue. Don't let it be an elephant because these men will mess around with it all the time and just get you paranoid for no reason. Just discuss it. Deal with it. They're not going to do it, most of them, anyway. Right? They just can't. Right? It's just something they fantasize about generally. Right? But bring it out and discuss it. Okay, let's leave it. I know a woman who used to always get upset about it. And then after that, she got so brave. I said, let's discuss it. They had the discussion. They have the discussions every now and then when he's coming up with something. They have the discussion, but she doesn't get perturbed anymore. I'll deal with it if it happens. I'm not going to get paranoid about it. And I think that was the same woman, if I remember correctly, who used to be so paranoid, she used to be suspicious of everything. She used to wake up in the middle of the night to mine his phone for pain. She's looking for the pain. She knows she, and there was something, nothing, and she's actually making up something out of that. But men don't help in this case. When they go to work, they may have numbers or colleagues on projects, and they think they know their boundaries. Look, I'd never do zina, no way, right? But they think a little banter is okay. And it's not okay. It's not okay. Right? And then they're like, why are you, so, why are you getting so paranoid? There's nothing going on. There is something going on. Maybe it's not up to the level that you don't want to take it to, but it is still dangerous. It's still haram. So, of course, this has to work both ways. But paranoia for women is very severe. It's very anyway, so the problem with this, uh, I kind of went off on this one, but the main point is that if you're narcissistic and have to be right all the time and domineering in that sense, um, the thing is that we love ourselves, our nafs more than anything else, so we probably don't even recognize ourselves like that. That's why this is a very difficult one to self-diagnose as well. But it would do us good, even if you're now 40 years into your marriage, to sort it out. Because believe me, a marriage is something that should not get worn out over time. Once I was sitting with this old sheikh, he's about 70, right? A spiritual Sufi sheikh. And we're in Atikaf, and we're sitting at the Dastar Khan, right? Iftar time, Suhoor time, I can't remember. You know what Dastar Khan means, right? No? 
Yeah, nobody saw you at the start. Can't mean that. It's this the it's the food spread on the floor. Oh, I shall. Maida. The maida. Well, maida could be a table as well, but it could be raised. But this is the start on the ground. You don't eat on the ground? Huh? Oh, I do, but yeah, okay. You didn't know it's called the start on. They use it in Urdu. It's a Persian. It's a Persian word. It's actually a Persian. Persian. It's not an Arabic word. So it's used in Urdu and probably Punjabi as well. We call it Sadri. Huh? We call it Sadri. A Sadri. In what language? Urdu. Okay. Chalo to you. Sadri is from the ch Sadr chest or Sadri. I don't know. Allah Hu Okay. So his son was there, twenty something years old. He said to his son, "Hey, have you called your mother? Is she fine?" So I said. Just as a joke, I was a bit informal with him. He's much older than me. He's like older than my father, I think. I said, "Sheikh, aapko abhi unki fikar ho rahi hai? Like, you still worried about her?" So he slapped me on the thigh. He said, "Malana," he said. Initially, it's all about intimacy, but as you grow, it's all about care and love. Wa jala bina kum mawaddatan wa rahma. So it's the love and mercy, right? And if you believe me, if you have a good marriage, it should only get better, right? It should only get better. If it's not, you got a problem. Something needs to need to do something about it, right? Uh, it should only get better. So um, then, there's so many other issues now. Do you see how we're supposed to think about this? How we should be thinking about ourselves as opposed to other as opposed to the other person all the time? How can I make? What's my issues? So another one would be, am I tight? Because there are some husbands they give a certain amount to their wives. Because generally in the Islam, you got the hierarchy of the husband being the head of the household as such to manage everything, not like a dictator, but to manage, right? Make sure everything's right. Make sure the food is provided, the accommodation, all that is provided. Make sure tarbiyah is right. That's his responsibility. It doesn't mean like he can. You know, just command everybody around or whatever. So, if you're if you're stingy, in fact, if you look in the hadith, the one of the places where it's allowed for a wife to do khiana as such, right, is in terms of money. She's allowed to actually take from his money secretly, because that's just. There's some guys they give some money and then they want to itemize billing at the end of the month. Now I know in some cases you do need some measures, no doubt, because, mashallah, some women they do like to spend as the, as some men do, but there needs to be that. Sometimes you have some men their letters cannot be opened by the wife. Their wives do not know how much they make; they don't know. Maybe sometimes good reason. I mean, there's one person he wanted to keep something with a friend. Like, can you keep this one while I'm away? Some money or something. In the days of cash, I think. So the guy goes, "Okay, but you know what? I can't tell my wife because she'll just tell everybody. Everybody knows that some husbands are like that. Some, so I can understand that. But there needs to be an open relationship. Your wife, your husband, there it should be a lot of um, a, a lot of trust there. So you've got lots of issues like that. Another issue: Do I like to do I do I like to be out all the time? Come back at one o'clock." There are many wives who are suffering in that sense. That's just not going to fly in a marriage. You're going to have to invest. Do I love my family too much? So much that even after I get married, I'm just going to constantly be at my mother's house. That's a big issue for a lot of people. So that their own house gets neglected. Their own. Another one is, am I going to let my mother remote control my marriage? Say this to him, do this to him, and so on and so forth. There was one couple that I dealt with where the wife was literally giving a, a WhatsApp group of her friends, telling her them everything <coughs> that was going on in the marriage. It's like there's enough soap operas out there. If you've got Netflix or whatever, and you don't need another one. So that's very harmful. The relationship you have with your children, your husband or your wife, is very unique. Nobody else is going to get it. That's why there was one mother who used to do this. Then one day, when her daughter called her for the next day or whatever, said, "You know, from now on, I'm not going to say anything to you. I want you to deal with your husband because you know him 
as I do not, right? Her experiences have been different with her husband to that. You can't. And the, eventually the daughter, after a while, said that was the best thing my mother ever did to me. That doesn't mean that if you've got major problems, you don't go to someone to get help. You do need to go, but it just needs to be that. Now you can understand, we need to look at ourselves to see what my... Am I, do I love my YouTube and my football and all that stuff too much? So that that's going to take most of my time. Am I an addict of social media? It's going to cause a problem. It may already be a problem. And then there's worse things. Am I into looking at haram? My wife is waiting for me in bed and I'm in another room doing some other stuff. Right? And one of the good du'as for that is a beautiful du'a. It's actually generally suggested for repayment of loans. But I found it that the, the, the meaning of it is very relevant to this or any other thing related to this. Allahumma kfini bi halalika an haramik wa aghnini bi fadlika amman siwak. Oh Allah, suffice me with the halal away from the haram. So the halal that I have, give me satisfaction in that. Because a lot of the time people are looking elsewhere. They have something really beautiful at home, but shaitan has just messed it up for them to such a degree that other things are glamorized. So they're trying to find happiness elsewhere. So, oh Allah, satisfy me with the halal away from the haram. And make me basically independent of anybody but you. Beautiful dua. Another dua I want to mention before I open it up to you for any questions, if there are any, is a magical dua for um, love, happiness in marriage, in marriage and with children, for both. It's a dua from the Quran. It's in Surah Al Furqan, verse 74. And please, let's read it together. At least we've read it once then. Rabbana, Hablana, Min Azwajina, Wadurriyatina, Qurrata A'yun, Waja'alna, Fil Muttaqina, Imama. What that basically means is, O oh, our Lord, grant us from our spouses. So the husband can read it for wife, wives, wife can read it for husband. Wadurriyatina, uh, children. Not just children, but Dhurriya actually refers to progeny. Until the day of judgment. You're talking about your descendants until the day of judgment. You've never probably thought about that. But Allah gives you a dua for that. Make from them a gladness and joy for my eyes. Now that doesn't mean just in this world but also in the hereafter. Can you imagine that on the day of judgment you rise and it said, This is your great, 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 great grandson or daughter and look what achievement they've done. And that gladdens your eyes. It's amazing this to eyes. And make us the imams of the righteous ones. Force for good. If you like to be on committees and like to be head of things and managing and things and all that. Especially, this is really good for you. So that you don't take on lead roles in the wrong. It's generally for the right. It's a very powerful dua. Now, the best thing about this. The ulama have written with their, through their experience about this dua. That this is such... An amazing du'a, powerful du'a, that if you have issues with your spouse where you dislike certain things and they're really bothering you, start reading this du'a as frequently as you want, as you can, then either Allah will remove and eliminate that problem from them. So certain things bugging you, Allah will either remove it or He will make it diminished in your sight so He won't bother you anymore. Believe me, this is one of my favorite du'as. And it really helps both for your, not just for your spouse, but also for your, your, your children and, and beyond. Because do you know why you need to make an investment in a marriage? Whether we're talking about before marriage or once you're in your marriage and it's not up to scratch, you know why it needs to be? A lot of the rage out there that people are doing weird things, it's coming from an imbalance. Why do people end up doing weird things? A lot of it is to do with an imbalance in their upbringing. Husband and the father and mother. Absent fathers are a big problem. They have a biological effect on daughters, for example. Absent mothers, of course, but generally it's more absent fathers than absent mothers. I had a case recently of a guy who used to be taxiing all night, comes home in the morning and he wants to sleep, so the children are not allowed to make any noise. 
So he gets very angry on the wife. The wife, literally the daytime is spent calming the children so they don't make a noise. Otherwise he gets angry because what a job, what a life. Allah take you out of there. You know, Allah help you. So these are things you know. Why? Because when you get married, we think it's just producing children, a halal outlet for my desires. It's what everybody does. Keep people off me, etc., etc. It is all of that, but it's something much bigger. Do you know what it is? You are starting a whole new line until the day of judgment. You are at the top of it. Have you ever thought of yourself as that? You are at the top of everybody that's going to come from you and your spouse. And don't you want to set some good vibes going down? Create the right environment. Because the right environment you create for your children, they will learn from them, hopefully create better work on that. And if we don't, and we just think it's just about us and my immediate children, you know, it's too short-sighted. It's too short-sighted. If we want to leave a legacy, how about leaving it for our own generations instead of for the rest of the world? Like, let, let's even focus on that. So I, there's a wealthy, influential, very righteous friend of mine who I've got. So he's leaving an endowment, a waqf. And it's amazing, his waqf. He's got a lot of money, so he's leaving it for the right reason. But he's saying that everybody, everyone from my family who's going to be part of this endowment, who's going to run it, lead it, and so on, administrate it, he's actually prepared a wird book that they must read this wird. Now, can you remember, how far back can you remember? Can anybody, I mean, they probably, you remember your grandfathers, grandmothers, but do you remember your great-grandfather? Some of you do, right? A lot of us won't. Great, great Probably not, because that's when it, it just that's that's where it ends. Now imagine if you can leave something, right? If we can leave something that will carry on, at least within our own children. That's why marriage is a much bigger idea than just a few small things that that we think about. The Prophet Sallallahu could say, "I was born from a whole ancestry of no zina." What a statement. None of my forefathers committed fornication. They were all married, even though maybe idolaters or whatever, but none, at least in terms of this, they were halal. What are we gonna set the trend for in ours? What balance are we creating? Right, remember it's much bigger than just us two. Right, it's much bigger than just two families. It's huge, we're starting. May Allah allow us to leave behind that kind of a serious environment, make the investment in it, correct ourselves in the process. We correct ourselves in a marriage context, inshallah. Because a lot of people are wonderful outside. They've had the training at work. They smile, they do everything. At the clients that come in, but they don't know how to smile at home. But if you can be good at home, believe me, that will work everywhere. That is our test. May Allah improve that for us. So let me just stop here, inshallah. And... Uh, I mean, if you, I mean, sometimes you may not feel comfortable. You can write it down if you want to, and send the note as well if you want to. And if you've got no question, that's also fine. We'll just have an early night. No questions. If we have questions, I'm just going to pass the microphone. Otherwise, I can repeat it. That's not like that's you can say. Go ahead. Um, you probably heard of uh, Mufti Abdul Wahab. In the uh, um, Bilal Masjid, um, he used to say he does the uh, he comes on TV as well. He does a lot of uh, the, the duo, but, um, but he, he says that uh, he said a number of times actually that uh, he wouldn't allow or he would wish he could no longer do nikah for people um, unless they've done a marriage course. So you know, I uh, that, that's a very good point. I've actually been recommending that to all the masjids I go to where I talk about marriage. I tell the imams and the committee, you guys really need to be serious because in, in, uh, in Malaysia, you have to take a course before you can get married. So I said that you need to hold at least two courses a year. And marriage season starts in like March, April, May, 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 right? So have one in March, have another one down the line in about whenever. And um, make sure they take a course. And masjid sometimes charge for marriages, right? So make it a big like 500 pound if it's... Uh, if you haven't had a course and 100 pounds if you've had a course or something give an incentive and or just don't do it you'll just inshallah help to change uh, uh, a lot that they should have a marriage course they should read a book right and uh, 
there, there's so many books out there to be honest it's not just one book there's so many books out there lots of people have written so the more you know the better because you have to be prepared for the real stuff in the marriage I don't know Mawlana Abdul Wahab, but uh, which masjid is he in? Uh, Bilal Masjid in, uh, in Greenfield. He, he actually comes on a... Oh, right, right. I've been to Greenfield Masjid. Well. He comes oh, on the Islam channel as well. He comes on the Islam channel as well. I'm not into Islam channel, man, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you like, see, he speaks really Urdu. Huh? He speaks Urdu. Only speak. Urdu? Yeah, his okay. English is a very, very, very fluent. Alhamdulillah, there's lots of Urdu people. Yeah, yeah, but he's amazing. No, that's very good. He's given a lot of examples of... A reason for the breakdown of marriage in the in the Jumu'ah. All imams have to deal with this. So I mean, the more everybody has to be speaking about it. Mm. Allah bless him. Bismillah. If a husband constantly complains of his wife's weight, even though I'm trying to lose weight, it affects our intimacy. But it's so hard doing housework and keeping fit and slim. I thought that would help you to keep slim. <laughs> I also have a health problem. D don't, don't mind me, I like taking, making a bit of joke on the questions, okay? So I don't know who it is, so it's okay. Um, I also have a health problem which causes me to put on weight and I'm taking medication for it. The, the thing here is that the, husb um, the husband, in this case, is just how you're going to get through him. If he's sitting here, then maybe it's okay, but if he's not sitting here, it's just how do you... When, you, when I get a question from a woman about her husband, husband's not there, I can only tell her what to do. I can't tell her about what her husband should do because he's not going to listen to you, they probably already said that. But I think basically, I think you should have a frank discussion with him, maybe show him doctor reports, that this is not me, make some dua, that I get cured from these things. And make him understand it holistically. Right? That, look, I'm trying, it's something I'd like to do as well. But if you keep going on about it, it creates depression. Depression releases the hormone cortisol, which is bad for basically everybody, right? That's to be scientific, like, what are you talking about cortisol? You know, so that, that these are some of the ideas, just or get somebody else to give him the understanding. And I'm, I'm going by what you're saying, that genuinely you are trying your best, right? Uh, I mean, whether he's justified to ask you for that or not, that's a whole different question. I'm only saying it by the fact that if you do have an issue, medically it's better for you and you're saying you're trying alhamdulillah you're trying hopefully he will understand that hopefully he will calm down with that some people are just looking for issues right hopefully it's not that hopefully it can be genuine but you probably you probably been married for a while you probably need to find another way to discuss it because sometimes what happens is that he's saying the same thing you're giving the same response you just become blind to one another and deaf to one another. Try to find another way to try to help uh, explain. Get somebody else to maybe help. Allahu uh, alam. I think you should probably go to Sister Sarah afterwards anyway. But that's all I can tell you for now. We've had to. We've had advice. Oh, mashallah, for pre-marriage and within marriage. Any advice when you are? going through divorce then you need divorce advice then i mean if you're having pre-marriage advice and then within marriage advice uh the divorce aspect subhanallah there's not enough spoken about it and people need to understand divorce so they do it correctly so they don't just do it with a point of no return there's actually adab in divorce so the thick of divorce, that's why in my book I've actually got a whole chapter on divorce. Sometimes when I'm actually conducting a marriage ceremony, I find that that's the best time to say some of the most important things. Because what I've noticed is that in a married ceremony, you'll get people who will not come to this dars today. Or a dars like this. And maybe people who won't even come for Jumu'ah. Or who, if they do, they come right for the prayer. But they come for a marriage because that's when everybody comes. So sometimes I use that to tell people about these critical issues. And on several of these occasions, I've actually spoken about divorce. Some people found that a bit like, these guys are getting married, you're talking about divorce. I said, I'm not talking to them, but it's something we need to know. Because there's a way, otherwise people do it out of mistake and things like that. So if, you're, uh, if this question basically is about uh, advice on divorce, then I guess you just, uh, you see, when you ask a question, it's always good to explain what exactly, the more detailed, the better, more nuanced answer you'll receive. 
feel like, okay, I just need adab of divorce. There's just so many adab of divorce. But uh, you need to be like, okay. So for example, divorce can be timed because the women have to sit in a idda, waiting period. These are just some general things to think about. You know what? The, the general recommendation is that when you give a divorce, you should not be trying to harm your wife through that. It should just be a clean break that you're trying to do. Divorce should not be used for persecution. For example, it's not allowed, it, it's bad, it's sinful to divorce your wife, make her wait for three periods, just before it's about to end where she'd be free, finished, you, you take her back because you have the right to do that in a, in a revocable divorce. That would be just be wrong and torture. Likewise, the reason why it's makru and undesirable to divorce in a menstruation cycle is because that just extends the divorce cycle. Several things like that. In fact, even after a divorce, once you're done and dusted, finished, do you know that it's a mustahab to give a gift to your departing ex-wife? Why would you do that? It's called muta'a, the real muta'a, right? It means a benefit, a gift that you give to it just to remove any acrimony. Because we don't need more problems in society. If you can't live together, Divorce, that's not a problem, right? In fact, in many occasions, I'll just say, look, you're better off just divorcing. It's not going to work. You know, we've tried everything. And ulama have written that as well. It's halal at the end of the day. It's just the worst of it when it's the wrong circumstances. There are some men who do not want to divorce their wives. They keep them hanging. One guy came to me and said, she wants to divorce. And so on. I said, okay, is there any possibility of you getting to it? No. So why don't you divorce? I said, I don't want to commit the haram. So divorce is not haram. Don't you get it? It's now it's actually haram for you to continue in this because there's no way to reconcile. You're actually persecuting her. You're losing all your reward if you had any of her being the bad person, as you say. Another guy, he met me in a program and he said, uh, Sheikh, I need to talk to you. I've got so many things going on in life. Health issues, job issues, this, that and the other. Do you have an hour? I said, I don't have an hour. Not everybody asks you for an hour, really. And then they come and you can do it in 10 minutes because really, it's, they don't need, you don't need the whole life story. So I said, okay, just give me a call. So he called me and I said, look, I've only got about 10 minutes. So let's tell me the biggest issues. He said, well, I haven't seen my wife for three years. I said, why? He said, well, she didn't want to stay with me, whatever. So we separated and for three years, I haven't seen my wife. I said, okay. She wants a divorce. I'm not giving her. I said, just divorce her. I said, no, no, I want her back. I said, do you really think I'm going to get her back? Three years, has a miracle happened yet? What are you waiting for? So I had to convince him that you're wasting your time and that's why you're getting sick, you're messing up in your job and everything like that. I said, clean break, Allah says, وَإِن يَتَفَرَّقَ يُغْنِ اللَّهُ كُلًّا مِنْ سَعَتِهِ If they separate, Allah will, and a lot of people don't think about this. Let it go. Keep your focus on this in the Quran where Allah says, if they separate, Allah will enrich each one of the two from his ampleness. Allah will enrich them. Have that as a focus. In fact, there's two places mentioned in the Sharia of which produces ghina, wealth. This is not something you do at home, but there's a scholar of tafsir. And uh, somebody came to him and says, I'm having problems with money matters. He says, get married. Because marriage is supposed to bring barakah. I forget the verse. There's a verse in the Quran that says, I forget the verse, I always forget this one. Um, if you get married, Allah will create barakah, right? You get barakah. So he came back and he said, it hasn't happened. He said, okay, divorce your wife. If it's not going to happen one, it'll be the other one then for you. But what I'm trying to say is that you have to remember, in fact, surah the, uh, the talaq masail in the Quran, the talaq rulings in the Quran, they're primarily in two places. One is in surah al-Baqarah. The other one is surah al-Talaq, the shorter surah. And what's the most amazing thing is that surah al-Talaq, while it's got many of the talaq rulings, it also has probably the highest number of, of cluster of verses about taqwa. وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبُ وَمَنْ يَتَوَأَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ Right, all the taqwa verses are there as well. That's why taqwa with marriage is very, very close and, and likewise with divorce. Keep your focus on Allah. Where it can't be, you can get divorced. It's fine. But there's a way to do it without any acrimony. 
And there you get the malicious mother syndrome, the malicious parent syndrome, where they try to deprive the other from the children. That's all oppression. I don't want to belabor the point. I hope I've answered you the question from wherever you got it from. <laughs> A question from may not be related entirely to whose role is it to ensure children's prey by the age of puberty? The husband or the wife? Both. I mean, if you're asking this question, it means there's a problem. It's everybody's responsibility, right? Husband can't say, man, you may need to make him pray. She says, he does. To be honest, it's the husband's responsibility, though. <laughs> it is the husband's responsibility. But that doesn't mean the mother don't do anything. Right? You see, in a, in a relationship, the husband and wife need to be on the same wavelength. Otherwise, there's just so much. The children will figure it out and they'll play one against the other. But from a fiqhi perspective, it is the father's, he's the head of the household, that's his responsibility. But the mother is obviously going to help out in that regard. And if she gets the job done for the rest of the life that the child prays, she gets the rewards. So if the husband is neglectful in that regard, and it's the mother, mashallah, who got the children to pray, she gets all the rewards. Or is the response equal in both parents? Do you have any tips on how to encourage the love for the prayer in our children? The, the, different people have had experienced different things in this regard, but one thing is, is to make them understand why they pray. Not like, you must pray. Right? Yes, they must pray. But why should they pray? So one uh, really good example that a friend of mine, who's not a scholar or anything, used to give to the children. How old are you? You're, four, you're five. And you are six, uh, eight. Have you got a favorite auntie whose house you go to and she gives you a lot of stuff? Yeah. Everybody has one of those aunties, right? You go and like, all smother you and everything like that. So if you go to her house, you're, you have an auntie like that? Who gives you a lot of gifts and everything? So... If you go to their house and she wants to meet you, to shake your hands, give you a hug, but what you do is you actually just run and find the Nintendo Switch or the game box or game, whatever it's called, and you just play on there. But she gives you so much stuff. Then you go again and you ignore her again and you're like, yeah, it's not like that. And then you just carry on and go. Do you think she's going to appreciate? Do you think she's going to still feel the same way. Do you see what I'm saying? So when somebody gives you something, shouldn't you give something back? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us everything. We need to impress that upon our children from a young age that everything is about Allah. He gives us all of these things. So we need to give. So let the worship be a, a gratitude as opposed to an obligation. And of course, the parents must be praying. So, Rabbi Jalni Muqim as Salati wa min Dhurriyati. Make me of those who establish the prayer and from my progeny. Again, it's all the way till the end. My progeny, not just my children. Inshallah, if you demonstrate your own love in your prayer and the you give anecdotes about the benefit of prayer, you teach them indirectly, you give them the reason why they should pray. That would be the best thing, to be honest. My son, when he, he goes to high school, uh, academy, and uh, th there's a proper prayer Jumu'ah that takes place in, on Fridays, but for Dhuhr, you have to kind of find a place. So he, his brother and sister also went to that school. They used to figure it out. He is a bit more challenged in that regard, right? So when he comes home, he's like, Did you, my wife says, do you pray? So... When he has prayed, yes, I've prayed. When he hasn't been able to pray Dhuhr, when it's going to get Qadha in, in winter, he'll kind of twist the story. He'll never lie. Never heard him lie, but like, I have prayed and he hasn't prayed. My wife once said, you're lying. I heard it from the other room and I said, don't, uh, later, I said, don't say you're lying. He doesn't lie. He may not tell you it clearly, but he doesn't lie. Now you tell him you're lying, you're just reinforcing the idea that you're a liar, so they will lie. That's a really bad idea. Do not ever say negative things to your children, especially if they don't do them. Right? It's all psychology. There's a lot of psychology in this. But the, the, the point is that 
Alhamdulillah, I think, I think he's got the regard for prayer himself. That they would pray for themselves. Because you can't always be after your children. That's with everything else. And a lot of people, they struggle. Should I give my child a mobile? There's one family I know, they didn't give it to their daughter. And she was 13, 14, 15, 16. They were like, we'll give it to her one day, but we're going to protect her. She actually got one herself and hid it. They figured it out. She was very clever about it. Eventually, she left it somewhere. They found it. And they confronted her with it. And what they eventually discovered is that every one of her friends have had one for the last four years. And she'd been the odd one out. They then recognized, okay, they dealt with it, but they recognized that they pushed it too far. Rather than that, so I spoke to a woman recently. She's like, how can I give it to her? I said, she's going to get one on her. She's going to look. You'd rather give it to her and show her the adab and say, I can look at it whenever I want. Treat her respect. Uh, uh, teach her respect and boundaries <coughs> and things like that. You can't win all the battles. You have to choose them and you have to be savvy about them. Allah help us. It's a tough, it's a tough task when it comes to children. Amen. Amen. So, Shaykh, is follow up on that first question? Um, so what should I do if he always complains to me about my weight and has no one to guide him? You know, I, I, I'm going to need a lot more information to give you a better answer. But the, I don't know, what can I say? And has no one else to guide him. I think you need to have a serious discussion with him. Make a stand about it. That would that is what I would then suggest. Make a stand about it. Can you think of anything else? Anybody else got a suggestion so we can help this situation? What's his weight? <laughs> I guess it doesn't matter what his weight is. <laughs> a lot of du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But have a frank discussion with him. Show him the medical records, if, if that's what you're saying you have, and so on. And just, just pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Say, I'm doing my best, I can't do more than that. Maybe there's some other literature on the discussion. La yukan Allah nafsan illa wus'aha. Allah only makes people responsible for what they have the ability to do. Right? That's as far as I can leave. Maybe if you give me more information, maybe later, some other time, maybe, or go to somebody else with this specific question. You know, scholars cannot do magic. Counselors can't do magic, right? And uh, we don't have all the information from us. I'm, I'm sorry, I mean, that's all I know. What else can I say? Allah help you. Allah help you. Read some Surah Yasin as well. Do some Tahajjud prayer at night with the Lord. May Allah make his heart melt and be more compromising and understanding. What if you want to educate your child in Islam but your partner doesn't and you practice Islam but your partner is busy watching EastEnders? Is EastEnders 24 hours or what? <laughs> that's, uh, that's a tough one. I said they're not on the same wavelength. That's a tough one. Look, I mean, I don't even blame this situation because sometimes, you know, you're not very practicing so you get married to a non-practicing person then you become practicing and then you want them to change but they don't want to change. It's a massive dilemma, right? So in this, you just do the best that you can do. Uh, if your husband or your wife, whoever that is, that's watching EastEnders, is it men or women who, watch it? who watches EastEnders? Women. Women. <laughs> <laughs> whoever it is, whoever it is. Right? Men is it both? Yeah. Okay. Or well, they watch Air Tour? More majority than women. Is it more women? Okay. Whatever it is. Um, so, I would say, if they're not going to do it, don't wait for them to do it. Remember, you got more incentive here. All right? You got more incentive here. So I know it'd be easy to just shift it to the other partner to make them do, but think of it that, remember, whenever you teach anybody anything good, especially on children, for as long as they do it, and they encourage anybody else. And if it's your children, they're going to make their children do it. You're going to get that reward forever. So look at, look at it as an opportunity. That Allah has given me that opportunity. Right? Um, a, a friend of mine, who's, mashallah, a philosopher. Uh, he said, he made a statement once. He said, this is not necessarily related to this, but in general, he said that the power that a mother has, 
or with the father as well, in terms of their children, is that if you have a good mother, she can basically give you a head start on the path to wilaya of about 17, 15, 17 years. Even more than the father sometimes, because the father is not as involved. The mother is the first mother of son. If you have a righteous mother, the head start she will give you in the path to Allah, because imagine it, there's a lot of guys who are not brought up in a, mus- in a religious home, they actually discover Islam properly and practice when they get to university, when they get older. They're starting now. If you've had a righteous mother especially, she's given you a head start by the time you're 15, 17, when you become mature and so on, mashallah, you're already on the path. That's the power of the parent, if you want to harness that power and do something about it. It's a huge reward. It's about progeny, remember. So forget the other partner for the time being. That's a different battle. Let's just focus on the children at least. Let's not lose both battles. Right? So the, the best you can do, inshallah. And Allah will help you. When you help others, Allah helps you. As the hadith says, that the Prophet ﷺ said, Wallahu fi awni al-abd, ma kan al-abdu fi awni akhi. Allah is in the assistance of a person as long as they're in the assistance of their brother. Here it's your own children is a responsibility. So you're getting huge reward inshallah as well. And Allah will facilitate, especially with these du'as that I mentioned as well. So, um, the greater dilemma in this case is when they're not on the same wavelength. The impression that's been given about, and then some parents will actually do that. I've actually seen that in separate couples where they're both vying for the attention of the children when they've separated and they get custody, right? Where one will do a lot of fun things and no religion, and the other one will be focused on religion and they're getting frustrated because the children don't want that. That's very difficult. I think the only thing that I can think about right now is that you're going to have to make religion as fun as possible. Right? That is going to take a lot of creativity. It's going to take a lot of time. A lot of things is that we just like to do things easily, quickly, without thinking too much about them. So I think one of the ways, I mean, there's not really much else, aside from your du'as and everything, which you will continue to do that a lot, make that difference. But... I think you're just going to have to make things sound as fun as possible and again get them. And what I've seen in that case, in these cases, is that some children will be more, well, they have that, that righteous gene in them, whatever you want to call it. They, they're like, yeah, I get that, right? My wife used to teach a girl and the father was more religious than the mother, I think. And she was like, yeah, I relate more to my father than my mother. But another of the children related more to the mother than the father. So you're just going to have to do your best, but I would just suggest that you make a lot of du'a. These du'as are very powerful. Parents' du'as are very powerful children. But you're just going to have to try to make it more fun and make, it, make sure it's not all boring. Right? So that whole concept of EastEnders was just an example, but it could be much worse than that. So you just do your best, just try to make it as creative and fun outside. Maybe get, uh, get her to get, uh, get the child to have other religious friends, find other religious mothers or fathers or whichever side this is on and then go and do something with them so it seems more fun I just had a case of some woman who is saying that her daughter and son are going to be a hafiz of the Quran and uh, she's not into extravagance she thinks it's not right and extravagance is a bad thing but the, cous- the, the aunties are saying to the daughter when you finish your hymn of the Quran you need to hold a big party this many people and whatever so she's telling her mom that, and the mom is like, no, no, we can't do that. That's kind of going into, I, we can't do cakes, that's haram or whatever. So she asked me, I said, no, 
This is where you need to celebrate. This is where you need to make fun. You need to make it bigger than anything else. Because this is a huge achievement and they need to recognize that. And that's how psychologically people are going to recognize that you do the best you can for this. That you really celebrate this. And there's nothing haram in celebrate as long as you're doing it within means and you're not showing off. You're doing it just for encouragement, for the deen, glorification of the deen, reverence for the deen. Um, the problem we have in our community, living in a, uh, living in a not a Muslim country, is that Christmas is all tinsels and bells and all sorts in school and everywhere. And when it comes to eat, people don't do much. In fact, some, some, some guys even send their children to school and eat. Right? You need to make Eid really good so that they look forward to that. Otherwise, there's that comparison. You do your best, inshallah. Sure. Um, there was a request if you could uh, maybe go downstairs to the women's side afterwards and take any of the questions they want to ask directly. After food, I think, inshallah. Okay. But if you have time. It's already 10 o'clock. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay, inshallah. I mean, don't come here too often. I'm not going in anyway. Uh, yeah. So are we done here? Yeah. Then we'll just do a dua, inshallah. If you are involved in community work to give something back to the community, should you sacrifice it to give more time to the tarbi of your children or learn how to manage it? What if you don't know how to manage it? This is, this is a major dilemma of people like me focused outside not focused on the inside that that could be the dilemma that you think you're doing your part because you're doing relief work you're doing you know some other really important outside work and that's the delusion of the shaitan yeah, our first responsibility is our children like Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said that if your children go wrong in any way the parents do have a part to play in that they're to blame in that so our major responsibility is for our children so we need to we need to ask Allah, Allah assist me, I want to do this work as well, but I want to do this work. But this is our priority. Because we're going to be asked about that directly, that's a fardul ayn for us. And that is a fardul kifaya for us maybe, or less. Uh, but uh, if you look at it purely from a fiqhi perspective as well, it's the local, it's, it's your family that's most important. Um, that doesn't mean you abandon everything, but I'm sure Allah will buy the barakah. Of you, if you're sincere, you're not doing it to show whatever, you're sincere, Allah will help you do both. And you're saying you don't know, you can learn. It's difficult, especially if fathers find it more difficult than mothers to deal with that. But then you need to work with the mother to do it. Because she needs the support. So even if you can't be directly doing the activities, you need to be there to support. Let the mother do the designing and everything or arrangement, but you need to be there to give that moral support at least. A lot of people, a lot of us men feel out of water, fish out of water when it comes to talking to the children or whatever. And that's, I think that's historically been the case. I don't think that's anything new, right? I don't think that's a new thing. Some men do it very well, some don't. But that doesn't mean that you neglect. You still play the part and assist the mother. Okay, Jazakallah khair. Let's make a quick dua, inshallah. اللهم أنت السلام ومنك السلام تبارك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم يا حي يا قيوم برحمتك نستغيث اللهم يا حنان يا منان لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إنا كنا من الظالمين جزا الله عنا محمدا صلى الله عليه وسلم وأهله يا أرحم الراحمين يا خير المسؤولين ويا خير المؤطين ويا معدن الجود والكرم we ask you for your special grace. We ask you for your special mercy. We ask you for your generosity. Oh Allah, this congregation of people who are sitting here. Oh Allah, there are so many other things that they could have been doing on this Friday evening. But oh Allah, they've chosen to sit here. Oh Allah, for your sake. Oh Allah, accept this from all of us. Oh Allah, allow the barakah of this to not only cover us, but our entire generations after us. Oh Allah, make this a point of turning for us. Yeah. Make this a source of purification. Yeah. Oh Allah, forgive us our sins. Yeah. Oh Allah, forgive us our wrongdoings, our shortcomings. Yeah. Oh Allah, our crimes. Oh Allah, we have many, many wrongs to our name. Oh Allah, we ask you forgiveness, especially for those things that we've forgotten. Yeah. Oh Allah, those wrongs we've done and we don't realize anymore. 
Oh Allah, especially those that are now become part of our life and we do not even consider them sins anymore. Oh Allah, we ask that you give us discernment and understanding. Oh Allah, assist us in our responsibilities in this world. Oh Allah, you've given us more than so many others in this world. Oh Allah, you've given us in abundance. Oh Allah, we wear the clothes we want. We eat the foods that we like. Oh Allah, there are so many others that are suffering. Oh Allah, remove that suffering from them. And oh Allah, don't make all of this abundance for us a punishment for us. Do not make it a burden for us. Oh Allah, you've granted us spouses. You've granted us children. Oh Allah, enhance this relationship. Oh Allah, make it full of understanding, love, piety. Oh Allah, make it love, full of love for you. Oh Allah, grant us your love and the love of those whose love benefits us in your court. Oh Allah, we ask that you accept us all for the service of your deen. Oh Allah, we don't know how we can serve you. We don't know how we can serve your deen. But oh Allah, you have so many things at your disposal. Oh Allah, there must be something that we can do, so accept it from us. Oh Allah, allow us to leave a legacy. Oh Allah, bless all of those who've established these institutes, who've established these masajid, these marakis and these other great places. Oh Allah, bless them. Oh Allah, allow them to rise to the challenges. Oh Allah, fulfill our permissible needs. Protect us from all of the evil that is out there. Especially protect our children from all the new challenges that are coming day by day. Oh Allah, do not make it such that they will grab us by the neck on the day of judgment and they will render us guilty. Oh Allah, we ask that you allow us to fulfill, that you allow us to be strong enough to deal with this, to be wise enough to deal with this. Oh Allah, make us, oh Allah, make us of those who are forces for good in this world. Protect us from being forces of evil. Oh Allah, bless all of those who facilitated this program and who facilitate these programs. Oh Allah, guide them aright. Oh Allah, remove, re reward them abundantly. Make this a source of sadaqah jariyah for them and their progenies, their parents. Oh Allah, bless all of our parents. Oh Allah, bless all of our deceased ones. Oh Allah, remove the difficulty from those who are suffering. Oh Allah, remove the uh, gr gr ground to cure to those who are, who are suffering from sickness. Oh Allah, protect us from the evil illnesses which are out there that are going around. Oh Allah, we ask that you accept <coughs> our coming here, our sitting here and make it a source of great barakah and blessing in our lives and remove the darknesses that we may have in our lives remove the absence of barakah in our lives and, and lives and, and and bring about blessing in our lives and oh Allah accept from all of us and grant us blessing oh Allah we finally ask you that you send your abundant blessings on our messenger Muhammad and that you grant us his company in the hereafter subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamu ala mursalina wa Thank you.